we're going to talk about Paul Ansel, and he's the boyfriend of Nicola Bully. She's the one missing in England. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so this is just an interview with him, the only one of seen so far. Nicola Bully went missing on the 27th of January while she was walking her dog. She had logged into a team's call at 9.01. She was seen walking her dog at 9.10. Police believe she left the phone on the bench at 9.20. The call ended at 9.30, but she did not disconnect. And another dog walker found the phone at 9.33. I mean, you, you're left sort of trying to make sense of the, of the census, aren't you? It is just such a mystery. Yeah, it it is. There's just no... Every, every single scenario comes to a brick wall every single one of them and then all we're doing is sitting there going round and round and round going through every scenario and then go back to the, f the first scenario again and do the whole thing again and then and it, it's just all day long that's all we're doing that's all we're doing how are how are you coping it must be so difficult like you say your focus is is on the girls and it and it has to be but yeah it, it must be so difficult i don't know how i'm coping I, I, can't, I, I don't even want to actually think about that. Just focus, just like I say, it's just about the girls, that's it. I'm there for them. Um, I, can't, I don't want to really elaborate on that. I just, I don't want to take my eye off that. It must be heartwarming to see the, the public response, I mean, hundreds of people trying to help. It's amazing. It's, uh, it is, right now, it's the only thing that we can take is, you know, that level of support is out of this world. Um, it gives us a, a great amount of comfort knowing that there, that's going on. They don't have anything else, do we? Well, there's hope. There's, yeah, we're never ever going to lose the hope. Of course we're not. Uh, but like, but right now, it is as though she has vanished into thin air. Like, yeah, just it, in, just insane. If you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. Greg? Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together the number one bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott, and I spend most of my time on business. All right. Well, Greg, tell us what you think we've seen in the video so far. Yeah, so as he starts off, right, as he says, that's all we're doing, you see distaste or disapproval at the sides of his mouth. He, he's got kind of a heavier set face, so he's not illustrating as much as muscles aren't mm -hmm. moving as much in his face. you got to pay attention to him. But his head illustrates exactly the duplication of effort as he's moving his head back and forth. And we say illustrates, we mean you're punctuating your thoughts or phrases. And we see that as he's moving, indicating some frustration. As he starts that, all we are doing, you see his tongue at the back of his teeth and kind of a sarcastic smile that will indicate frustration. And then at how are you coping, you see increased respiration as a question or starts to make this real to him. I think we see a guy who came in with kind of a stoic behavior. And when you start making it real, then we start, start to see respiration increase. And we see his blink rate increase. You might think, well, that's an attack and he's trying to protect something. I don't see that. I see him as trying to hide it and it comes up. His head nods and he... he then goes to an emphatic downward movement at just the girls and that's it. There's an appropriate amount, amount of eye contact. We associate people who make too much eye contact with trying to persuade you. We don't see that. And when he's talking about comfort and all of that, you see some pain in his lower faces, the sides of his mouth withdraw. And then his blink rate goes up when the guy says something about hope. I think he realizes he should have said hope and he feels awkward about it. Nobody wants to say, hey, I don't have any hope for this person, especially with the kids on. And so I don't I don't think what we're seeing is guilt. But what I do think we're seeing is a person who's feeling maybe some personal remorse for not having said, hey, we still got hope. The eye blocks. And then he disclaims how insane that this whole thing could happen. And you see his face at the at the last part is some confusion as the sides of his mouth go up and his brow goes down. We associate that with confusion and some head shaking, all that congruent messaging. And this is insane. This is not possible. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I know a lot of people have their eyes on this uh, individual. Why would that be so? Well, he's really the only person who's been interviewed uh, for the public. 
And uh, look, if there is homicide, it is statistically high that it's going to be the end somebody to point a finger at and you've only got one point a finger at it feels you know kind of okay to ever it's already statistically low that it's aside in the first place because then they're they're not very common in the uk uh, at all uk is about sixth in the world lowest for for homicide and if it is the intimate part, if it is a homicide and it's the intimate partner, statistics 80% is more likely to happen in the home and not out in the open. So look, I just want to give you another statistical bias to look at this with, other than the statistical bias of we've got one person and it's the partner pointing the finger there. Here's one thing that you're not going to see in the body language. You're not going to see any grief in the forehead. Why? Because he's wearing a hat. So you can't see it. You can't see anything going on there. It's cold as well. Not much movement in the face. He's from the north of England. Going to be pretty stoic. He's from Lancashire. There's a more kind of negativity. For anybody who knows Carl Pink Pilkington, he's not from uh, from um, Lancashire. Um but but there's some similarities in terms of the the kind of the negativity that goes on the kind of the heaviness around the world so he's not likely to be that um kind of culturally optimistic and so you see that cultural difference between the interviewer who's from the south of england going hey you know there's hope and the northern guy is already gone look this is like this is we keep hitting a brick wall we push we push the it up the hill and it rolls back down again it's what we call this sisyphus cycle whereby everything that you do returns you to the same place i think what we see here is um well, the, the, the we, we do see uh, distress. We see the insanity of the situation. We see somebody who's at their wit's end, I think, around around this, but still has to keep a good uh, front. The voice breaks on that. That's all we're doing uh, every day. That's all. We're, no, sorry. That's all we're doing. All we're doing. The voice breaks on that. Great amount of comfort. The voice breaks on uh, that. Um, he doesn't do anything to protect his whereabouts or, or, or to, um, give any, uh, any reasons why he wouldn't have been in the location. He doesn't point any fi uh, fingers at a character assassination. There's no like, well, you know, she will go down to the river and she will kind of, you know, mess around with the dog and walk around and he doesn't give any kind of reason why there might be an accident. There's no chaff and redirect there. So I, I'm seeing somebody who is uh, it's utterly confused by the situation and a, a bit of a wit's end. Uh, Scott, what do you got? So when you thought it reminded you of Carl Pilkington, that was in the very first, in the very beginning of that, wasn't it? Or was it? Because that's well, what no, throughout. I mean, throughout it, for me, it's it's very, very similar to that northern kind of heaviness, you know? Okay, so they're all like that, because I thought it was just Carl. No, uh, well, Carl's from Manchester, and he's you know he's a bit he's more even more extreme. <laughs> but, oh, okay, but yeah, it, okay. there's a general. Everybody from Lancashire is going to have a real go at me now. Everybody from Blackpool is going to going to have a go at me now. <laughs> but I mean, it's 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 a pretty heavy place. It's cold. It's damp. It's nasty. Yeah, you know? well, that's exactly who it reminded me of was Carl. But I think we're seeing a, a person who's very frustrated. And after he explains what he's what's been happening, we see him take a deep breath, that ex exhale, then he lets it out. And this is indicative of in a situation like this one of frustration. That lets us know he's frustrated, and he's very relaxed. His cadence and volume are fine. He's not adding th anything like you were saying, Mark, as far as uh, qualifiers go. He's not saying, here's what happened to her. I think it happened to her. Somebody gets, no, she could have done this. Nothing like that at all. He, he has no, he doesn't add anything to it, uh, to what he thinks might have happened. Quite often, uh, when a person has guilty knowledge or they're involved with a person missing, they'll give several examples of what they think may have happened, and they'll keep going back to the one over and over again. And we've seen a couple of examples of that before. And uh, sometimes when you're talking to somebody who's, in my experience, when you're talking to somebody who's embezzled money, and, you'll, and you've got a group of people that you're going to go through, you're going to talk to each one of them, and you're going to start sorting out the ones you think might be a possibility to have taken the money and, and those uh, who didn't. One of the things I always find interesting is the person who didn't take the money, you can say, well, 
how hard is it to get to that money? How hard is it to get in there and, and, and make that happen for if I was going to grab some stuff like that? And they'll say, oh, Lord, you know, they've, they've got things, checks and balances, but I can show you nine things right now how to get back there and nobody would ever know it was you. You can take that stuff all day long. You can put stuff in it, nobody would ever know. We all know that. Everybody can get to that. Whereas the other person will say, when you ask them the same question, how would you get back there and do that? They say, oh, it's impossible. I mean, it's almost impossible. I mean, they've got checks and balances you got to go through. There's, you know, they'll, they'll check it on the way in, check it on the way out. They'll be giving examples like that. This guy, and, and, and but when you, a lot of, but quite often when you're dealing with some, with a situation where it's, it's a person missing, it's almost the opposite of that. The person who didn't do it will say, you know, I don't know how you do it. And, you know, or where they went, I don't know what happened. You know, like this guy's doing, she just vanished. And quite often we'll hear from people who, when they have a child missing or their husband is missing or their wife is missing or they're, they know where they are, but they've been murdered. They'll say, uh, I think this might've happened. This might've happened. And they'll keep, like I said earlier, going back to this one thing over and over, trying to convince everyone that that's what was happening in that situation. So it's important to keep in mind with all the information you, you gather about situations and situations similar to this one, that each person is different and every situation like this is different. And I'm just talking in generalities, the way, from what I've seen, the way people act going down those specific ro roads. So you have to be able to recognize what road that person's going down that you're talking to. So are they going down that road of you can do all these things? Or are they going down the road of it can't happen? You know, there's only one thing or two things that could happen. I think this is what happened. Hmm. So you've got to decide which road they're going down and pay attention to that. Outside of that, I don't think this guy's hiding anything. His demeanor stays the same the whole time. His answers aren't prepared. He's, I think he's just talking. I agree with you, Mark. He's just, he's just saying as it comes to him, he hasn't sat down and thought out a specific uh, chain of events that, that could possibly have happened. There are not three or four scenarios. He's not going back to one scenario every time. He just says, we don't know what happened. It's just like she vanished. No, no idea. I have no idea what happened. That's why I, I think we're looking at somebody who, who's most likely innocent. Chase, what do you got? I agree. I think he's most likely on the innocent side of this. He's definitely got an external locus of control where the world happens to him. He's not very much in charge of things. But we're seeing a ton of things stack up here to where I think he believes, not that he's guilty of doing something, but I think he believes that this is a foregone conclusion. And it all starts with this one moment of it's all about me and the girls. It's not about her anymore. It, it, he doesn't discuss it at all. Not one tiny bit. And he thanks the people for their support and not their assistance. That's a big deal in, in looking around. And he's introducing complexity and data and difficulty to finding her instead of encouraging people to help and talking about his outlook and how she might be found. Lastly, uh, well, almost lastly, he forgets to use her name here, doesn't use her name, doesn't make an appeal for help from anybody. And there is zero mention of a desire for her to be found or for her to come back home. That is extremely odd. So something's off. Or he's already just come to the mental conclusion that there's nothing he can do about it because of his external locus of control. I mean, you, you're left sort of trying to make sense of the of the census, aren't you? It is just such a mystery. Yeah, it it is. There's just no every, every single scenario comes to a brick wall. Every single one of them, and then all we're doing is sitting there going round and round and round, going through every scenario, and then go back to the, f the first scenario again and do the whole thing again and then and it, it's just all day long that's all we're doing that's all we're doing how are how are you coping it must be so difficult like you say your focus is is on the girls and it and it has to be but yeah it, it must be so difficult i don't know how i'm coping i i, can't, I, I don't even want to actually think about that just focus it just like i say it's just about the girls that's it i'm there for them um I, I don't want to really elaborate on that. I just, I don't want to take my eye off that. It must be heartwarming to see the, the public response. I mean, hundreds of people trying to help. It's amazing. It's, uh, it is, right now, it's the only thing that we can take is, you know, that level of support is out of this world. Um, it gives us a, a great amount of comfort. 
knowing that they're that's going on they don't have anything else do we well there's hope <laughs> there's yeah we're never ever going to lose the hope of course we're not uh, but like but right now it is as though she has vanished into thin air like yeah just it in, just insane uh, overall mark what do you think we've seen so far yeah, out of those choices there, Chase, I would go for the second one. Uh, it's not in his control there. Um, you know, I really feel for, you know, everybody in this situation and uh, and the, the family. Uh, I know search crews, extra search crews are going up, and um, I think we'll get some answers very, very soon uh, on this. Um, so, uh, but I think if anybody is looking in his direction right now, in terms of being a perpetrator of a crime, I will say categorically, you're looking in exactly the wrong direction. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yep, I agree with you. And I would say that I would maybe minimize the severity of that a little bit for my mind, just seeing this one little clip here that I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't take him out as a suspect here personally. Greg? Yeah, I don't know whether or not he's involved or has something going on in his head that makes him feel guilt for something happening. Who knows what anybody has in their relationship? Right. Could have had an argument before somebody walks out. Look, we can't read minds. We can read symptoms, and that's what we're all doing. What I see is a guy who's there. I Mark, I think culture plays a huge part. If you're in the U.S. and you're in certain cities, you'd be like, oh, no, this is what's happened. But when it's not common in a culture, I think it's less likely for that to be the first thing that comes to your mind. And you're more likely to look for like, what what could it possibly be? So I think we see some of that. The interesting piece is the deviations in his baseline. And remember, we talk about baseline being what a person normally does in this situation, not sitting home eating pie. And the deviation is when they ask about hope and they say, there's always hope. You see his everything go up we say blink rate goes up that's a good indicator of stress respiration is a good indicator of stress is that because he has said something that might make people think less of him maybe so what i didn't see is a lot of guilty knowledge a lot of that kind of thing what i saw is maybe abnormal compared to a person who lives in the city in the u.s where crime is very prevalent but i don't i'm with mark i don't i think he's the wrong guy if you're looking for the right for the person who did something scott what do you got I agree with you. I think what we're seeing is frustration. I think he's very frustrated and he's because, like he said, they're doing the same things over and over again, which is normal. That's natural. That's what you do. You go over it and you keep asking him the same questions. You ask these people the same questions. You look in the same places, not exactly the same places, but the same areas. So I think we're just seeing frustration. I, I, I didn't see anything on him at all that that suggested uh, any kind of of deception or anything in there. I think he's concerned and I think he's tired. I think he's, he feels like he's just about over it, but there's no getting over it. Uh, something like that. You just have to get through it. So Rough. I, I, I think he's, I think he's being honest and um, I think it's where we're sitting with him. All right. I think this is a good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?